Great. Hi, welcome to the New York Parrot Literary Corner. Today we have Sherry, Drat, Sherry Felt Dratfield, who graduated from Goucher College and is a member of the Phi Beta Kappa Society. Uh, she received an MFA in acting from the University of Denver and holds a JD with election to order of the COIF from New York University School of Law. Sherry's third collection of poetry, Millie Collins, Your, Born, Your Barn is Gone, was just published by Servina Barva Press, um, February 2021. Sherry's two previous collections of poetry, The City and Water Vigils, both by Finishing Line Press, were both nominated for a Pushcart Prize. Her poems have appeared in various journals and anthologies and have been awarded recognition in the Margaret Reed Contest for Traditional Verse, Jewish Currences, Rain's Poetry Competition, and the Passenger Poetry Contest. Sherry lives in the West Village of Manhattan with her husband, Simon. They visit their shore home in Ventnor City, New Jersey during all seasons. Welcome to the program today, and I am Dustin Pickering, your noble host. Uh, Sherry, I hope you're doing well today. How's uh, life out there in New York? Life is great. Life is returning to um, to craziness again, and uh, mm -hmm. it's doing busyness. Yeah, it's it's getting good down here too. And things are starting to pick up a little bit. And this COVID thing is really giving us a knock on the head, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, a few, a few. <laughs> quite, yes, quite a few knocks on the head. So um, I'm curious. Uh, you know, your your finishing line press titles, um, the city and water vigils. What what themes do you explore in in those uh, in those books? I explore. This in the city, interestingly, one of my favorite places in the world is Venice, Italy. Okay. And the city takes its inspiration from both New York City and Venice, Italy, and occasionally other cities. So I explore the uh, universality of our lives through cities, even though the experiences may seem different. In a sense, we're all tied together. So that's the city in the water, in, in water vigils, as we have so many bodies of water in this world, again, the universality is that water is water, whether it's salt water or brackish water or spring water, lake water, dirty water clean blue green it's all water and we are all made of water so my poems in water vigils obviously explores different bodies of water and nature mm -hmm. uh, a lot of nature is uh, inspirational for me i'm not mary oliver she's the nature poet mm -hmm. but I find a lot of inspiration and hope in bodies of water that's very interesting. So even with, when you have the theme of a sort of the human architecture of the city, and then you have the, the bodies of water, which is natural architecture, um, and you still you're exploring this sort of theme of interconnectedness uh, in your poems, and and how things are sort of complex. So you know, there's a lot of complexity underlying even the simplest of arrangements. Uh, you know, that seems that you know that's one of the themes you're exploring there. Yeah, I think you're that that's precisely it. I may not have articulated it as uh, clearly and simply as you have, but you <laughs> on the head. I think that we have uh, there's so much complexity, but underlying the complexity, we all there's there's this universality, this universality of hope and mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. the up movement even though we may slide downward there's just a universal movement so yes right so it's a you know it's a, it's a upward slope up to you know to betterment a very uh, steady progress even though you know like you said there's occasional little drifts down you know that's yeah. wonderful um and that's very hopeful i think we, we definitely need stuff like this uh, out there in the world with uh with our 
crisis that we just overcame on, you know, I hope we won't fall back into that for a while now. Um, so what is the story behind Millie Collinger Barn is, is gone? That's an interesting uh, title. Is that, is that a real life story or is it came from an artwork or? Well, it's interesting you mention it. This is, this is Millie Collins, your barn is gone. Okay. And actually, uh, this is the city and water vigils. Hmm. Nice. Something, something they share, and I'd like to uh, give a shout out to the artist mm -hmm. who um, who permitted me to use her paintings and monotypes for all of my covers. Her name is Mary Beth McKenzie, and she has over forty works in the Metropolitan Museum of War uh, of Art. And uh -huh. the story behind Millie Collins' or Barn is Gone. That's my title poem and I do hope to read it it'll make it clear but mm -hmm. I find that Millie Collins was lived on the same long deserted country road as my late in-laws in Conway Massachusetts a rural town above Amherst area mm -hmm. um, and at one point her barn obviously became gone, which is subject mm -hmm. of my poem. And I found in that a synergy with my feelings that in life, everything is gone. It's all transient. Mm -hmm. But what happens when it's gone? Is it despair? Do we have despair because someone we love is gone or because uh, the tree that we loved was knocked down by a careless neighbor? Or do we think about what's going to replace it? Or if not replace it, move in and grow from it mm -hmm. and move to a different place that will be even better than the barn, uh, a better barn or a, uh, a grove instead. Mm -hmm. a grove. So that's how I experience life. And when I want to find my, my book, Millie Collins, your barn is gone, uh, is the table of contents is actually set up from Ecclesiastes. Okay. Each chapter is one of the oh, nice. parts of Ecclesiastes. Very so, structured. For, yes, and for example, the, the first one is, has poems, uh, an appointed season, an appointed time. And the second one is a time to give birth and a a time to die, to plant, to uproot. So it goes mm -hmm. like that, as life goes like that. And I was wondering what I should entitle this book because it has a lot of disparate things. I mm -hmm. have lots of different forms that I use, lots of different topics. How do we unify that? And as in life, especially chaotic lives, there's something that grabs you. And I felt that Millie Collins, your barn is gone catchy title <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it also is a title a title that incorporates my sensibility oh your barn is gone you may be gone so what's mm -hmm. next and if you open my book you find out what's next interesting so you know i've read a lot lately uh, on psychology of growth mindset that's what i think you're describing is like rather than look in the past and say oh this is you know this is gone it's it's no longer you, you think to the future and you say what can what can i replace this with you know what is the what is the future bringing in the possibilities open up in these times of uncertainty where things are just leveled and there's just nothing it feels like there's nothing going you know for you but yet there's something around the corner that you know you need to be prepared for and instead of blowing on the loss then uh you know and then people I mean, that's natural for people to dwell on loss, but I think it's also very healthy to think what is going to come from the future. Yes, it, precisely. And as opposed to dwelling on the loss, dwelling on what was and how that has mm -hmm. woven itself into your own life in a positive way so that you can use it to grow to different places. That, I've never heard of that theory, and I'd like to look into it more. Yeah, Aeon uh, Magazine, uh, their Psyche uh, edition shows has a lot of that kind of stuff in there. The 
growth mindset. There's a lot of literature on it now. Uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, and that's uh, that's uh, dealing with anxiety and, and uncertainty and uh, you know, looking at possibilities instead of dwelling on the loss and the devastation and you know all the uncertainty aspects of uh, anxiety. You look at it as a what can I do to move forward in this? Yes, because despair is not a strategy. It's, Absolutely, it's resignation. So, right, we go from strength to strength, and we hope mm -hmm. to be the person that helps other people know there's goodness in the world. So if we can, if we can use that, even when we're feeling just everybody feels despond. Yes. Some have more, have a lot of challenges. And yet, how do we move forward and grow our world, not just us and those around us, but our world? Right. And that's definitely something more positive than dwelling on, you know, the, the destruction out there. You know, you want to you want to you want to be, uh, you know, optimistic. But you also want to be realistic. Exactly. So and this is kind of a question that sort of leads from from the from this uh these these possibilities um in your writing do you ever propose aesthetic problems to solve and what problems or what questions do you think your poems ask that you propose within your your work well i think i do i i think i understand it's a great question and my mm -hmm. mind is going towards the poems that i have that unearth a wrong or a social injustice. For example, uh -huh. I have a sonnet called Dear Mary that um, there's a, a, a triptych, a Bellini triptych in the Basilica de Frari in Venice. And mm -hmm. it shows Madonna and Bellini used the same Madonna. She must have been 13, she was young. And there's such humanity. And I go there all the time. It's in the sacristy there. And I, I sit there and I look at her and her eyes are looking away. And I get from her and she's holding this baby in a way, the, the, um, the child Christ. Mm -hmm. And I'm Jewish, so I'm, mm -hmm. I don't have that investment into the Catholicism or, or that Christianity, but the way she's holding that baby is as though she, she fears. And, um, and in that poem, I wrote that poem at a time when there was so much, uh, there's so much black and brown uh, death mm -hmm. and lynchings and, and it's, it's so dis spiriting that people could feel that way and the fears that I feel. I have a son who is a minority mm -hmm. and I invested my sonnet in exploring her fears of the men, those in royal blue and the fears she had. And I asked her the question, um, will my son survive an early death? Mm -hmm. So I integrate issues, I don't think I resolve them, mm -hmm. but I integrate those issues. Uh, and there's one other poem, these are not poems I was planning to read today, but Hallelujah, which one uh, is a poem that won a, an award with Jewish Currents poetry competition. Julia Larkin, who's a wonderful poet, had selected it and it's called Hallelujah. And it's about an actual protest by the Westboro uh, Baptist Church, which is a hate group. It's not mm -hmm. really a Yeah, I'm familiar with them, <laughs> unfortunately. They, they came to our synagogue. I belong to the largest LGBT synagogue in the world. And they came to our synagogue. We knew they were coming to protest. And we decided to do a counter protest. So we had many, many people there, Jews, non-Jews, Muslims, Christians, and we all came to the place where they were protesting outside the synagogue. We were singing um, Psalm 150, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And it was very joyous. Mm -hmm. 
And the poem is about that. Hmm. And it's, it's not a negative poem. It's actually a very hopeful poem. So that's how I deal with issues that mm -hmm. are fomenting around me that we may not have answers to, but we know we need to look for them. And I try to write poems that help us find a way to find our own way through those. Right. And that goes back to the growth mindset, you know, trying to think in terms of uh, what can I contribute to the to these issues? You know, what can I say or do that will be helpful? And, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the Westboro Baptist Church, which, is, as you said, is a hate group, not really a church. It's a, a fake organization, if you ask me, it's fraud, basically. Uh, and so that's interesting that you kind of challenge them, but you don't do it in a very combative way in the poem, as, as you described. You do it in a way that's, uh, you know, uplifting and people that would read this poem, you know, they're not going to feel rage or hate towards the group. Maybe they might feel something more akin to the uh, respect and admiration for the group that was singing the praises and, and, and being rejo rejoicing and being joyful in the moment. So I think that's very nice. It's lovely. You know, it's a very optimistic look at, uh, uh, at a very dark situation, you know, con confrontation. If, if you want to read a poem, feel free. Uh, it doesn't have to be that one. It could be uh, whatever you uh, have prepared. Okay. Uh, well, I had thought to read the title poem Millie, of Millie Collins, okay. your poem. And incidentally, I would like to thank Leah Maines, give a shout out to Leah Maines and uh -huh. uh, and Finishing Line Press for publishing these. And, and Leah now is a very good friend of mine and guide. Uh, also, mm -hmm. Gloria Mindock, who published my my book, Melly Collins, uh, is has also become a good friend uh -huh. and guide counselor. So uh, I dedicate these to to them. Excellent. So, Millie Collins, your barn is gone. Abby cleared it after folks on our road said outright kids would get hurt. The floor had been mostly missing since just before you died and took your D-A-R roots to the grave. Not to mention that poor nameless mongrel you kept staked in the front yard never saw him fed or taken in, never told you I tossed him bones from the car. Ob's a fixer, but once the roof sagged, that barn was done. He and Brenda bought your place from the gal who'd taken care of you, can't think her name those last years. Only good thing maybe you ever did, Millie, leaving your place to that good woman. This week, Abby put a big red barn just where yours was, just where. I watched the whole time Ob was at it. Odd to see newness on the spot where so long ago you and I went late one night after drinking your cheap tea from chipped cups and dug that tiny grave deep enough Hmm. Interesting. And your performance is wonderful. It's very conversational. You know, I like that. I, li I enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to um, read another one. Sure. Do you want a Venice poem or a child poem or one that has music in it? Let's go with the music one. Okay. I was going to ask you a question about music in a little bit, too. That's something I was going to go in there. So that might be a good segue. Okay. <laughs> Okay, this is called Late in New Orleans at Snug Harbor. Do you know Jimmy Durante? Do you know who he was? No, he, I don't think so. Okay, he was a vaudeville star, Jackson and Durante. He had a big schnoz. Mm -hmm. We do, we do. And he, um, he was a singer. He's very well known. And mm. I happened to look him up afterwards. Uh, okay. I happened to have met him because my family was in show business. Um, late in New Orleans at Snug Harbor. 
When I was small in your blue room, Nana, Durante taught me the steps with top hat and cane that Jackson, was he dead, had danced with him. Oh, won't you come home, Bill Bailey? He made me laugh. The hat's so big, but how to put it on so I could take it off. He kissed me with his nose. I cried the whole night long. He made me work. He made me like my skinny legs, soft shoe, us two. I sang. I waved a cane. Tap, tap, twirl, tap. With this new old tickly man who made me get it right and treated me grown up. Were you watching, Nana? You rarely noticed me. I can't recall your laugh, but your visitor, he is in my heart's harbor, a close up wrinkly grin. I know I'm to blame. Gone, the vaudeville riff played by these jazz men. Now ain't it a shame? <laughs> Hmm. Interesting. Uh, quite a performance again. You know, you, I, I I remember you said uh, in your bio you talked about having a a bit of a bit of an acting background and theater background. Do you does that ever teach you like how to appreciate uh, performance poetry when you watch like I don't know if you ever done watch slam poets or uh, people do performance style poetry. Yes, yes. Well, I, I made my living as an actor for seven years. Okay. And, uh, and I loved combining music and improvisation. My husband's a flutist. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I do, it does inform how I present. And then when I became a lawyer, uh, I used the acting improvisational to help me win cases. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's yeah. actually funny. I mean, I, it, it's ironic. It really, uh, to me, it's, uh, you know, of course, you know, part of a case is like the presentation, you know, it's like how well you can present your, your uh, arguments. So I think it's funny that you use the theater and theatrics a little bit in the, in the courtroom too, as well. <laughs> yeah. And it's also knowing your audience. Absolutely. Audience. Absolutely. You, you have to know the judge or, or the way people are responding to you is is very important mm -hmm. and they have to believe you're for real not just putting on a case and you you should be kind of an ironic question um you know you know the the poet shelley once said that uh, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world and since you have a law degree how do you how do you feel about that what do you think that means exactly it's a very different type of law, if you ask me, but it's sort of a funny question to ask. Well, I think it goes along with our theme for the day, mm -hmm. actually, that if you, the people who read poetry are nudged in a direction mm -hmm. to legislate the world, to legislate in a non-legal way, but to legislate mm -hmm. how we're going to move forward. I read many poets, um, but I would say reading Walt Whitman, for example. Yeah. If my husband and I read poetry every morning and we read a little bit of several poets, Billy Collins and Walt Whitman are actually good examples of this. Billy Collins mm -hmm. writes these poems that are incredibly accessible, seemingly whimsical and simple and yet if you if you read it it's leading you in a different way it's sort of legislating how you go through the day it's like a meditation telling mm -hmm. you uh don't don't it, don't think about a tree this way think about a tree that way and <laughs> care for it more uh he wouldn't be so political in what he said and walt whitman embraced everything mm -hmm. he was legislating up and down and saying well if you're a prostitute or if you're the king or the queen it's all the same we're all the same we're all humanity and it goes through in great detail so if you're reading walt whitman 
you will catch what speaks to you mm-hmm. and then how you use that because you're used to perceiving things in one way. Mm-hmm. And no one's going to acknowledge that a poet did this, but the next time you are on the water in a boat or you're seeing the boat come in or you're seeing someone you're not familiar with, you're seeing someone of a lower economic class than you, you're going to see that person in a different way because Walt Whitman sees this person as devoutly human, as you are devoutly human, Mm -hmm. everyone is devoutly human, the prostitute is devoutly human. So that unacknowledged part of it, poets don't need to be acknowledged. Poets certainly don't become poets for the money. They're there. You're there because your heart tells you you have to do it. And why do you do it? You hopefully you want people to read it to nudge them mm-hmm. in in a, a way that doesn't require acknowledgement. One of the best poets I know, Grace Shulman, who is the winner of the Frost Medal Award for Lifetime Achievement, and uh, she was the nation's uh, poetry editor for many years. She co-founded the Underberg uh, Poetry Center in in Ninety Second Street Y in New York, and mm-hmm. she's a brilliant poet. She doesn't care about being acknowledged, but you read her poems and you're enlightened. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not about acknowledgement. It's about writing so other people can learn. Right. Do you think recognition from like, say, awards or, you know, uh, does that that affect a, a poet's sensibilities or does that, do you think that affects their writing style or anything? I mean, like, you know, kind of an acknowledgement. Sometimes I feel like fame and fortune, like kind of numb people in a way and they don't become as, as passionate and as angsty or maybe even as uh, powerful in a way when they're writing if, as if they were writing from the, the ranks, you know, down in the bottom of the, you know, within the, the field per se, you know? That, that's a great question. And I've never thought of it before, but I'll contrast two different things. Okay. I've been in, in show business as a union actor for many years. I'm still mm-hmm. a union actor, but I don't act. And I will say that fame, fortune, I knew someone when, I knew some people when they weren't famous and then they became famous and it changed them mm-hmm. from the other who didn't but it can as poets i would say that fame and fortune is kind of on a different level mm-hmm. you're acknowledged you could walk out in the street nobody's gonna save a table for you because whoa it's grace you know it's grace showman let's give her the best table at a restaurant right the acknowledgement however helps you continue because as poets acknowledgement, even getting published, a poem getting published is wonderful acknowledgement because it's an outside, you write poetry by yourself. Mm -hmm. Even though there are lots of people around you perhaps. And the feedback you get from your spouse, from your children, maybe one thing, but from the outside world, you can get a sense that you're on the right track. It may not change, however, how you address writing poetry. I think pe- poets really follow their own their own nature in writing right. poetry. They, Wild species. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, you've traveled a lot. Have you participated in a lot of the poetry circles in other parts of the world? Or uh, how are they different from, say, where you're at right now in Manhattan? I don't know. In in um, places where I've traveled, they're writing poetry in languages that I don't speak well. Right. I've done poetry readings in other areas, but I'm, I don't know that I'm qualified. That's a great question, and I hope someday to be able to answer it. <laughs> At this juncture, uh, I'm not even broad enough to see all of the poetry circles. I go to the conferences, I read, I have friends who read. I think it's a very, I have found poetry to be a very supportive area where the people at least that I have come in contact with will do whatever they can to help. I I have not seen dog eat dog 
Yeah, yeah. I don't know where that poets are. Poets are very different people, I think, we, and then scholars often are too. And you know, I, I've heard in the acad a lot of academia circles, they're 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 kind of cutthroat sometimes. But in, uh, poets, I find that we we tend to be a little more like you know supportive of each other, and we're not really in a competition for some kind of anything you know it's just uh help each other out in the community and build a and build a, a community of people that are supportive well that's that's actually true because no one else can write millie collins your burn is gone right just, and whatever other books are there they're what they can be wonderful but you're not really in competition because you can't write their book and they can't right. write you i often said you know some people have complained about being plagiarized or, or would they be plagiarized if they put their work in the public space and I'm like well if someone did that they would be foolish because it's like the joy is in writing the thing not in the getting it published or seen and if you put if you're taking credit for something that someone else created I mean that's just silly I don't see that I've never seen that happen and at least in my circles but I do know some people do that with a lot of the Instagram poets and, and people like that they I've seen a lot of that happen but, uh, you know, it's, it's really not something that I see is, it's, it's, of course, it's unethical. It's very unethical, but I just don't see a, a, any kind of person that's writing poetry trying to literally, you know, plagiarize another person's work, uh, you know, and, and take credit for it, you know. And so I think that that, that shows, that reflects the kind of ethic we have as poets, that we are very individualistic and at the same time we have a community that we build, you know? Yeah, so. yeah, I think that's very true. And that's not to say that we don't read something that somebody else writes and, and or to put it in a positive way, when we read other writers whom mm -hmm. we esteem, they may say something, they may, you may read something that was written that spurs your imagination mm -hmm. and you're not stealing the expression, the fixed expression of the poem but you're, you're learning and becoming enlightened and you may write a poem based on what you learned from that poem, mm -hmm. which is an idea and ideas are not copyrightable. And that's, that's the greatest flattery to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. see that someone else has written a poem that took one of your, your ideas that was maybe a unique idea that you put, that you wrote down in a certain way and then somebody else writes a poem and you see that idea expounded upon in a different way, it's flattery, it's wonderful. Absolutely, it's, it's good to kind of, you know, get that DNA, you know, out there, you know, when people take your poem and your influence, then take you as an influence to them, you know, and it shows your own originality and your insight, as well as, uh, as the fact that someone's taking interest in what you're saying or doing, you know, that's very flattering. It brings us back to Shelley and what, what you mm -hmm. asked about Shelley. I hadn't heard that before, um, but it's that same unacknowledged legislation mm -hmm. that we wish for. Right. Do you find that music ever influences your uh, poetry composition? Do you ever turn on like some, some old music or something to kind of relax while you're writing? Uh, oh, yes. And my husband plays classical flute, and I love that. And you just reminded me, um, it's a very, very short poem. Um, it's called A Cappella. Okay. And if, if you have a moment, let me see. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, even find it. Yeah, here it is. It was written in, in Venice, but uh, it. <laughs> okay. A Cappella. Mm -hmm. The song bird woke me, five, eight, 10, eight. I'm gonna start over. The song <laughs> bird woke me, five, 10 a.m. today. He has done so all of May. A cappella, perfect pitch close by. I cannot see his perch, cannot translate his lyrics. I feel his joy pronounced rich in aria, clear sky, or rain, his hope revives each day. By 520, he has soared to a farther stage. I strain to hear the fading trills. 
no more. Sometimes he returns, encore. The morning curtains drawn, carmony bells ring six gongs. The boats and gulls first moan, the soloist has flown. Hmm. Wonderful. And seeing that as a bird and seeing a flute. I mean, that's so, that is such a poem. I mean, <laughs> I can't say anything else about it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's, it's a nice uh, way of looking at, you know, an early morning bird out there, you know, doing their, during their song, you know, in the morning and you hear it. And, and then, you know, as you said, encore, it came back and sang again. And I yeah. like what you say in there where you say, I can't translate it. I don't know what it's saying maybe, but you know, that goes back to what we were saying earlier about the various poetry circles and, and not being able to speak the language, maybe being able to appreciate what they represent or who they are and, and, and artistic, you know, community. Yeah. Not yeah. knowing necessarily what is being said or exactly being communicated, but still being able to appreciate. I mean, I, I, I sometimes hear people on the program, we have them speak in other and, you know, in a native language that they, that they're um, maybe if Italian or Arabic or whatever. And I like to listen, even though I don't know what's being said, you know, it's, it's fun to listen to other languages. Yeah, that's really true. Um, a friend and mentor of mine, guide of mine, Helen Cardona, mm -hmm. who is a fine, fine poet. And her father was uh, from Catalonia. He okay. was also a poet. And she is, she, her mother's Greek, so she, re, she speaks Greek, Spanish, it, she speaks a lot, and French. She has a French accent, and she's also an actress. And mm -hmm. she has books, and she has, for example, one book she has is in French on one side, and it's in English on the other side. And mm -hmm. sometimes readings, and she'll read it in French. She's translated her father, who I think wrote in Catalan and his poems are in one side and hers in the translations are in English and she'll read both. And that's wonderful because you don't understand the words, but once you've heard it in English and you listen again, you, you do understand it. You, you get the rhythm of mm -hmm. it. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's an enjoyable experience. So I think we have a few more minutes remaining. If you want to uh, give, impart any wisdom to the fellow artists out there and, and writers or say some thank yous to people who have inspired you, you know, we have time for that. Well, that's that's great. And I, I think I've already mentioned Mary Beth McKenzie, who, mm -hmm. who the artist and my dear friend of many years, and Helen Cardona uh, and Chervena Barva Press with Gloria Mindoff. And Leah Maines, uh, who is finishing Line Press, they've all been incredible guides. So I, I thank them all very much again and again. Can never have too many thank yous for people who love you and uh, mm -hmm. inside cool. and out. Uh, and uh, I thank you, Dustin. Thank you as well. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Words of wisdom are just for anyone who feels they are poets not to be intimidated, just to write. And when you have nothing to write, take a walk and see what's around you and find one thing and just write. Write anything, write for yourself because from that creates something else. So I guess Absolutely. I well, thank you to, for joining us today, Sherry. It's been wonderful talking to you. And I, I wish, I hope you continue to write and, and put some new uh, legislation <laughs> out <laughs> there, some unacknowledged legislation. <laughs> I, I actually am. I'm, I'm... Uh, excellent. Well, okay. this has been the New York Parrot Literary Corner. I'm Dustin Pickering. You can get in touch with me at literarycorner at newyorkparrot.com if you're interested in being a guest on our show. We do this globally. Uh, we just we appreciate artists all over the globe getting in touch with us to uh, speak to us on um, our program. And if anyone would like to donate to help us out a little bit, we've got uh, paypal.me slash nyparrot. That's paypal.me slash nyparrot. And you can find the link at our YouTube station. 
and please subscribe. We're looking for 1 million subscribers. That means anyone out there who has not subscribed, please do. We want you. We want you in our community. We're looking for a lot of subscribers. Please share our flyers, our uh, our videos, anything you, you know, you appreciate about us, let us know. If you would like to share some words of criticism, please feel free also uh, put some comments on the, on the videos and let us know what you think. Uh, tell us what you're thinking. We want to know. Uh, so this has been Dustin Pickering at New York Parrot Literary Corner, and uh, I'm signing off. And it's been a wonderful talking with you, Sherry. And uh, have an excellent day. You never know where we'll be tomorrow. We're looking forward to seeing what's going to happen uh, for the program as well. Uh, so just uh, go out there and do some writing. Get out there and get active and uh, commit to some, some art. So th thanks to our viewers. Thank you all globally for uh, paying attention to us and giving us some uh, credence and uh, talking about us. We appreciate you very much and all our donors as well. Uh, we thank you very much. So thank you again, Sherry, for joining the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dustin. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome.